Today, the church celebrates the great feast of the baptism of the Lord. We're in year A, so we're going to be looking at the account of the baptism in the Gospel of Matthew. But before we do that, just an important reminder here that the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord is one of these interesting feasts. It's kind of a bridge between Christmas time, between the season of Christmas, and ordinary time, where we begin our journey through the Gospel of Matthew looking at the public ministry of Jesus. So technically, the baptismal feast, the Feast of the Baptism, is in Christmas. It's the very end of the Christmas season, but it's also launching us into our journey through the public ministry and the life of Jesus that will take place over the course of the next 34 weeks in year A as we walk step by step with Jesus through the Gospel of Matthew. So in order to bring Christmas to an end and to begin that process of journeying through the Gospel of Matthew, the church takes us to Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 through 17. And this is Matthew's account of the baptism of Jesus. Now the baptism of Jesus is given in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and even John has his own take on that. But this is probably the most famous and the most familiar to most people. So let's read through it together, and then we'll unpack it and look at how it goes with the Old Testament. And also we're going to home in on a peculiar aspect of this account that's only present in the Gospel of Matthew. So Matthew 3 verse 13 says this, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. Now John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Okay, so what's going on here in the story of Jesus' baptism? I think most of us are kind of familiar with the fact that the baptism of Jesus marks the end, in a sense, or the climax of John the Baptist's ministry, and the beginning or transition into the public ministry of Jesus himself. Um, But what would it have meant in a first century Jewish context? What would it have meant to Matthew's initial Jewish Christian readers, people who are reading the gospel through the eyes of first century Judaism? In their perspective, there are a few things that would stand out here from the baptism of Jesus. Number one, the geography. It's really important here for us to be familiar with the geography of Matthew's gospel, because geography in the Holy Land isn't just geographical, it's theological. All right, so places have theological significance. So when Matthew says that Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan, to John, every first century Jew would have known that Galilee was the northern territory. It was the place where the 10 northern tribes had once dwelt, and that Judea in the south was the place of the two southern tribes, and that the Jordan in particular was a river that ran southeast of the city of Jerusalem and poured its waters into the famous Dead Sea. So the Jordan River was basically the eastern border of the Holy Land, the eastern border of the Promised Land. And every Jew would have known in the history of salvation in the Old Testament that the Jordan was particularly significant because it was the place where the exodus from Egypt had come to an end. So if you recall at the time of Moses in the book of Exodus, when the Israelites are set free from Pharaoh and they begin their journey toward the Promised Land, the exodus, which means the going out, really wasn't accomplished until 40 years later they crossed over the waters of the River Jordan and entered into the Promised Land. Now, that is narrated in the book of Joshua, chapter 3 through 4. And if you go back to the book of Joshua, you'll notice something interesting about the crossing of the River Jordan. I think most of us are familiar with the crossing of the Red Sea, right, at the beginning of the Exodus, because there have been movies made out of it. But there haven't been as many movies made out of the book of Joshua, and so we tend to be a little less familiar with this text. But in the book of Joshua chapter 3, it describes the people crossing the Jordan to enter the Promised Land. And listen to what it says in Joshua 3, 14 and following. Quote, When the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan, with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and when those who bore the Ark had come to the Jordan, 
and the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped in the brink of the water, the waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap far off at Adam, the city that is beside Therathan, and those flowing down to the sea of the Arabah, the salt sea, that's the Dead Sea, were wholly cut off, and the people passed over opposite Jericho. And while all Israel were passing over on dry ground, the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. End quote. Okay, so notice here, for a Jew in the first century, there are two miraculous crossings of water. The crossing of the Red Sea at the beginning of the, of the Exodus and the crossing of the Jordan River at the end of the Exodus. So when John goes out into the wilderness, and he's proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Any first century Jew familiar with the Old Testament would have caught the echoes of the exodus from Egypt by John's location in the Jordan River. Um, and as I've shown in my book, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist and elsewhere, in the first century AD, you have to understand, the Jewish people were waiting for many different things to happen. One of them, one of the central hopes, was not just the coming of the Messiah, but the coming of a new exodus, in which God would save his people in the future age of salvation, like he had saved them in the first era of salvation, the exodus from Egypt. So there would be parallels between the old exodus and the new exodus here. So John, when he's proclaiming to the people a baptism of repentance, and he's beginning to tell them that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, they would have recognized that he's heralding the coming of the new exodus and that the Messiah that was expected to come would be like a new Moses, right, who would inaugurate this new exodus. So when John goes out to the Jordan River, um, all those echoes of the exodus are there. And so what the people are doing is they're preparing the way of the Lord by repenting of sin in order to help usher in, so to speak, to be prepared for the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the kingdom of God. Um, now, in that context, John is baptizing, and it says very explicitly, this is the second point, was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It says that earlier at the beginning of Matthew chapter 3. Um, and so when Jesus goes down to receive the baptism, John is, so to speak, brought to a halt, right? He objects because he says, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me. Now, this objection of John is only in Matthew's account. So we only know about it from this account of the baptism of Jesus. Very interesting here. Because um, as we know from elsewhere in the New Testament, like Hebrews chapter 4, Jesus is fully human, but he's like us in all things except sin. And we see that kind of implied here by John's response, right? Because if John is giving a baptism of repentance from sin, right, for the sinners, people who are sinful in the people of Israel, then why does Jesus need to receive it if he himself is sinless? Now, Jesus answers the question by saying this, let it be so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Now you might be thinking, okay, thanks, that clears everything up. Uh, this is one of those sayings where, you know, we read the gospel and we proclaim the gospel of the Lord and everyone says, you know, thanks be to God or praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. But in the back of your mind, you're thinking, I'm not really sure exactly what that meant, right? Um, it's one of those puzzles. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. So just press pause on that and hold it for a second because I want to end by looking at exactly what Jesus says there. For now, the point is this. John recognizes Jesus doesn't need baptism or repentance, but Jesus wants to do it for some reason. It's fitting for him to do it so that he can fulfill all righteousness. At the very least, the language of fulfill in the Gospel of Matthew should make you think of the fulfillment of Scripture, right? that there's some prophetic dimension to Jesus' action here. There's some typological dimension to Jesus' action here, that he is fulfilling the scripture and he's fulfilling salvation history in some way, shape, or form by going through the baptism of Jesus. And I think that that, although as we'll see in a minute, um, there's another meaning to his words, I think that's really clear if you look at Matthew's account of the baptism of Jesus for a couple of reasons. Notice here what happens. When Jesus goes down into the water, he comes up out of the water, and the heavens were opened, and he sees the Spirit of God descending like a dove. Now, most of us are probably aware here that what's happening is 
a kind of anointing of Jesus with the Holy Spirit, right? So he's going down into the waters, and the Spirit is coming upon him, and he's being anointed by the Spirit of God, because that's what the Messiah is. The word Christos, Messiah, means anointed one. And just as David was anointed with oil in the Old Testament, when he was made king over Israel, so now Jesus, the true king, is being anointed, but not with the oil from a horn like David, who had oil poured over him by Samuel, but with the very Spirit of God himself, right? Coming down upon him in the form of a dove. So we see here another echo. This is an echo of David being anointed king over Israel, but it's Jesus here being anointed with the Spirit of God. A third, or fourth or second, I can't remember how many I've said here, a third echo of the Old Testament is in the line, the heavens were open. Now, you might just think, oh, okay, well, that's how the Spirit comes down from heaven because the Spirit's in heaven, so he's, you know, the heavens have to be open for him to come down. But any first century Jew familiar with the Old Testament would have had another passage from the Old Testament in mind, and that is the ascension of Elijah into heaven. So although most of us are probably familiar with the fact that at the end of his life, Elijah the prophet is taken up into heaven, what we tend to forget is where that happened. In the book of Kings, in 2 Kings chapter 2, it tells us that Elijah was taken up into heaven after he parted the waters of the Jordan River, right? So what happens when Elijah, at the end of his life, goes to the Jordan River and there the heavens open and he is taken up into heaven, right? So that's the Old Testament background. Jesus something similar happens to at his baptism. In his case, watch this, this is really fascinating. It isn't the waters of the Jordan that part so he can go into the promised land like the Exodus from Egypt. It's the heavens that are open in the same sense that Elijah went up into heaven at the end of his life. So Jesus here is at his baptism, there's reveal, being revealed the nature of the new Exodus, right? So the first Exodus was an earthly journey to an earthly promised land. But when Jesus goes down into the waters of Jordan, it's not the waters that part so he can go into the earthly promised land. It's the heavens that part so the Spirit can come down upon him. So what is going to be the ultimate destination of the new exodus of Jesus? It's not the earthly promised land. It's the heavenly promised land, the one to which Elijah was taken at the end of his life at the Jordan River. So you, you've got to think about the theological geography here. All of these echoes of the Old Testament, all of these connections or parallels between the old and the new are kind of being woven into this one tapestry of Jesus' baptism. A lot is going on here in this one moment. So in other words, Jesus is inaugurating a new exodus through his baptism. But that's not all. There's another allusion to the Old Testament. You might be wondering here, 